I'm going to talk about uh, cardiovascular and critical care for the cardiovascular patients. All of you will have patients go to ICU, and that's a very integral part, and, and, and that's something where you have to figure out how it's going to be management, collaboration, partnership, and why is all of this important? Because if you, if you don't have a big insight, and all of you have rotated through ICU, but the paradigm of shift in the critical care is actively changing, and that's what we're going to talk about. So you may go break in ICU. You have, all will have complex cases. They will go to ICU, and if they don't do well in, IC, in the ICU, uh, nobody, you know, nothing happens. So you can do a great stenting. You can great, do great surgery, but if they don't go out of the ICU in a decent way, it's immaterial. So as far as patient is concerned, they want to come out of the hospital very good. It's not that they only come out with the cath lab or the OR very good. They want to leave the hospital in good shape, and that's very critical. So your case can go great in the OR cath lab, but they can really not do. But the key thing is they did survive a post-operative course. You can have top-notch cardiologist, top-notch surgeon who can do a fabulous job, but if there's no partnership, collaboration, and active engagement in the intensive care unit, those complex patients will not make out. And that's very important to, as far as patient is concerned. As you all are dealing with increasingly elderly patient population, redo, redo operation, patients, so these towers are being done in 90 years old. You know, stenting them 80 years old. So it's like people expectation, the societal expectation, especially the media driven thing wise, the shows like House and the Chicago MD, you know, this magic happens within 45 minutes and they all, most of them walk out alive without any consequences. How many patients have you seen walk out on crutches or on the vent and trach from a House or Chicago MD? And those are, go you know, this is mind-boggling. So what that does, it, it sets a societal expectation that every single case, and whether it's a cardiac case, surgical case, will do fabulous. And when you're going to have that dialogue with the family that things are not doing fabulous, they look at you and, what are you talking about? So that's a very, very important piece that you have to understand, and that's why it's important to have this dialogue before your intervention and after this intervention. Pay for performance. All the hospitals are being held accountable to pay for performance. Their Medicare basically is running out of money. So the way Medicare is, it is picking up winners and choosers. They are withholding anywhere from 1.7 to 2.0% of payment to the hospital. And interestingly, it's now expanding to physicians also. What they will do is they will withhold your 2% or 1% of your payment they're supposed to owe you. And people who do very well, whether it's hospital or physician, they will give them more money. And people who don't do well, they're going to not pay them. Now, you can imagine that, uh, you know, we can see 2% what's a big deal. But hospitals are billing hundreds and millions of dollars of billing. 2% is a big deal. They will not buy you your new equipment or new cath lab if they're losing money. And if you are billing in a group uh, about $10 million, 2% makes a difference. So all of these things are making an impact, and these are public reporting. 30-day readmissions, heart failure is one of the big deal. Cardiac MI, cardiac surgery is becoming uh, big as far as reportables. In New York, they all report for all the surgeons are reporting, cardiologists. So as far as transparency is concerned, everybody is, should assume, and you all, when you be practicing my, in, in, and very actively, you should assume that all that you do is going to be publicly reported and you're going to be held accountable to. So if you go with that, that's better. So all the whether it's not only your procedure, but infections, whether central line, urine tract, readmissions, all of them are going to be there. Medicare, how many of you have gone to the CMS hospital compare website about your institution? Anyone? Dr. Whelan, you don't count. You're the faculty. <laughs> all right. Any one of you? Okay. One. Please go and check out your hospital compare website. People will check it out. It tells you the mortality of MIs, heart failure, stroke, infections, and people are making judgments. Your, your payments and your referral basis are being based on that. The larger insurance companies are pushing payment, patients to the institution which you're doing well. So if you're, pay, you're not getting patients, so no matter, you can be the world's greatest cardiac surgeon or vascular surgeon or cardiologist, you're not going to get patients. So you please, you know, that was all of this thing have to be relevant. Okay. So cardiovascular question, you know, this is something which, you know, it's mentioned before. Perioral MI, bleeding, DVT are some of the key issues. Ultrasound, you know, uh, most of the ICUs are very actively using ultrasound not only for parading lines, but putting, 
you know, fast exam for, uh, for and echoes have become routine, part and parcel of critical care training and practice. So, you know, it's not only one domain and because it's make a big difference and the key thing is to minimize some of those devices. Blood pressure management is nitroglycerin and nitri the first choices. Nitroglycerin, you know, has been a great drug for decades, but that's a very poor antihypertensive agent. Nipride, you know, the cost of nipride, let me just tell you, it used to be $20, now it's $900 for a bag. So if you're going to be primarily using nipride, believe me, you'll have phone calls coming to you. So, and there are better choices. And again, as I reach all my residences, as far as blood pressure is controlled, you have to make sure before you go for other drug, the patient is not in pain, the patient is not agitated, and then you go for any drug. And before that, unless there's a heart failure issue, poor heart, or you're on anotropic support, always control the heart rate first before you use any preload dilator or afterload dilator. If you don't control the pain and anxiety, no matter what drug you dial in, it's not going to work. Blood transition. So at what hemoglobin you will give blood? Nine? Seven. In all patients, seven, or in some patients, seven? Some patients. So who, what, is the, you know, what does the literature say in which patient is seven we can give, we should give blood for seven? Any takers? So somebody is having, is if the patient is requiring inotropal vasopressor support to maintain blood pressure, it's okay to give blood for seven and higher, okay? And the other data is really is about patients having acute ST elevation MI, and that also is seven. The third category is patient in septic shock, that also category. Beyond that, you have to watch. However, all of you are practicing in different institutions across the country. Is that the most common practice all across with your attendings? Not necessarily. We're counting on you to make the difference, okay? You, we're gonna hold you accountable after five years. Bleeding, surgical control, medical management is a key thing. In a lot of the data is, you know, people are using case centra and other, you know, concentrated progress to make a big difference. Again, if you don't control the bleeding, whether it's surgical management, you'll end up giving blood and components. So you have to proactively think about that. Appropriate DVD prophylaxis, I know Dr. Ash talked about it, but I can share you some insight. We just recently did an analysis at our hospital. We looked at four-year data. We included 146,000 patients. The incidence of DVT, all cause was 0.6%, and of the set category, about 13% developed into PE. Uh, we found out that the patients, uh, the most common date when the diagnosis of DVT was day number seven and or eight. And if the uh, you know, DVT prophylaxis was done day seven or eight, it, was irre it did not make a difference in prevention or prevention of PE. And the, so what we figured out, and we're gonna be publishing soon, is that the both best opportunity is really in day number four and five to make sure the patients are on appropriate DVT prophylaxis. And again, you have to remember SCDs and the chemical prophylaxis and SCD, mechanical. Mechanical uh, sequential compression is why SCD is a squeeze of blood. Just because you've ordered SCD, don't assume they're on patients and, and they're working. If you've walked it on, they'll be on the floors and they'll be on the sides. So just don't imagine that just because you've ordered it, it happens. So you have to make sure it's important there. Respiratory man management is the key thing is outcomes are fluid management in the OR and trap and post op The key thing is if you give too much fluid, you'll pay the price. It's a very fine balance and it has been shown. Blood component transfusion, again, or the more transfusion you give, higher risk. Sedition holiday, DVT prophylaxis, waking up the patient, and all of this will make a difference. The most important aspect that you can do is early mobilization and, and physical therapy. You should really push for having a very active physical therapy engagement in your ICU. Walk the patient. Unless they're on pressors, even with pressors, especially in our long patients who are on heart failure or another, we walk them. We walk patients with ECMO. We walk patients with, with uh, you know, axillary bloom pump. We walk patients with vent. There is absolutely very few, few contraindications for not walking. And that's it. You, if they don't walk, they'll be, have multiple pressure ulcers, DVT, infection, decondition, demoralized. So one of the key things you should really make sure is you have a very active physical therapy program in the ICU. That's going to be a huge deal. Multimodal pain management. The goal really is opioid sparing. 
all of the data is showing the, the opioids are really making a huge negative impact on pain. There are multiple approaches where there is, is uh, blockage, you know, local anesthetic block, regional blocks, non-opioid uh, main medication. There are a multitude of them out there. You got to focus that. Don't, because right now the most common therapy of pain management is pick up one drug, whether it's Dilaudid, fentanyl, morphine, and people escalate that. That is not the solution. And everybody is working in it to kind of minimize the goal should be opioid sparing. Because with opioids, that causes higher incidence of uh, your ileus, your uh, sedation, and all the stuff. Right? So you have to think of what you're using. The other aspect is if your patient on sedation or need in them, you need to be thinking of op benzo sparing because benzodiazepines, especially Ativan and Midazolam, are known to be a very high risk factor for causing delirium. If a patient is confused, delirium, and thrashing around, you're not going to be leaving the ICU, you're not getting out the van, you're not leaving, and the most common thing, you will get a CAT scan. A confused patient will do a CAT scan. So, you know, there's an ask to the whole stay and cross, right? So that's uh, the key point. A hospital like cardiac infection, you know, these are surgical side infections, central line and CAR-T, public reporting there, down payment, they're not getting paid for it. If they're not getting paid for it, somebody's, you know, paying the bullet. There are bundles all of it. Bladder bundle, this is not detailed, but it's for you and your handout. The most important thing is, do you really need the Foley? And if you really need the Foley, okay, that's okay. Is the most important thing is, is getting them out. And most of this institution which have worked very well is nurse-driven Foley protocol. You develop guidelines when they come out and they take it out. If they have to keep on calling people, it doesn't happen. So nurse-driven uh, Foley removal protocol have worked very consistently good. Surgical side infection, where you put cath, where you put central lines in, cats in, surgical, all of these things. And one of the key thing is, you have to remember the traffic through the cath labs and OR has found to be one of the highest factor, people going in and out, going in and out. Interesting thing is, we do central line courses at our institution at our MIT lab, which I think you went there yesterday. We are done in courses for our residents, fellows, and other people who insert lines, and we found out the biggest area of weakness is not that they can put these things in patients. The biggest area was weakness was draping and gowning. There were so many breaches while they were gowning and gloving. And there were so many breaches when they were draping. It is not the, the, the minimum issues were putting lines in. The most issue was before they, they, they could not really gown and glove. The surgeons are actually the best person to do it because this is their train. But if you're not a surgeon, I would strongly encourage you to kind of have somebody look at you, how you're gowning and gloving. Don't assume that we are magically born with the God's gift to how to drape and gown. Doesn't happen. Okay, so the other thing which is uh, central infection, these are bundles hand out to you. And as I mentioned, that's one of the key factors you'll be aware of. So one of the, some, I'm gonna wrap it up. It's all about communication. Those days are gone and that I'm the big boss, I'm God's gift to mankind, I know everything. Okay, that doesn't work. Absolutely don't work. If you go with this attitude in this day and age, you will be a not very pleasant person. You will not get the Doctor of the Year award, I can assure you. Uh, so you have to work with the team because unless you plan to stay in the ICU 24 hours a day and you are happy to get phone calls about potassium and calcium and leg pains and agitation around 2 in the morning, 4, 5, 6, 7 on a scheduled basis, you need to work with the critical care team. They can really work with you. And the gain thing is partnership, and one of the most things is communication. If you talk to people, it does help. Collaborate. It's not about you or them. The key thing is it's all about the patient. You know, if it's all about the patient, then it's not about you and them. Okay, so it has to... If you want something to be done, you have to work with them that set realistic expectation. Don't assume people know things. Don't assume that they know your protocol or your approach. There are, there are in Methodist, I think there are about 90 plus cardiologists in Houston Methodist. Are you supposed to know everybody's advice? No. So you have to, you may have certain quirks, other person may have quirks, they can be 50 quirks for the patient. What are we supposed to follow? All right, so there has to be some consensus approach about that. Intra management, cath management, especially with full management, hemodynamic interests are very key. All right, so public reporting, I hate to stay, and by the time you'll be practicing in the next five, 10 years, much more, you'll be amazed how much you'll have to publicly report. With that, we said, thank you so much. <laughs>